One Peter Five is a crowdfunded traditional Catholic online journal. We are dependent on your donations to keep this content free for all. Please make a tax-deductible donation to our spring fundraiser at onepeter5.com slash donate. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to the One Peter Five podcast, Rebuilding Christendom, Restoring Catholic Culture and Tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, Editor-in-Chief of One Peter Five, and I'm joined today by our new contributing editor, Theo Howard. Theo, how are you doing, brother? I am very well, Tim. It is a great pleasure to be here with you and a great honor to be contributing to the great work of 1 Peter 5. Yes, thank you. We're, we're very happy to have you. We wrote today about the uh, interplay between the United States traditional movement and the traditional movement in Europe and in England. So we're going to talk a little bit today and Theo is going to introduce himself, talk more about uh, some of these aspects um, so I wanted to talk first about what is the role of Catholics in England in the traditional movement since the Second Vatican Council? What are your uh, insights about that? Well, I think that um, uh, England, English Catholics occupy an important place uh, within the, uh, let's say, the traditionalist movement, the traditionalist cause, the cause for the uh, the Apostolic Roman Rite, which also encompasses uh, the defense of the church's um, doctrinal integrity uh, as well, um, and tradition in, in the widest possible sense. Um, I wrote in uh, my piece for 1 Peter 5 on the English response to Traditionis Custodes about um, the Agatha Christie indult of 1970. Um, and uh, just in brief, this uh, special sort of dispensation was secured by the um, the actions of the English traditional laity uh, with the, the backing of the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster at the time, Cardinal John Heenan, um, to, uh, to, uh, and, was, and was forwarded to uh, Pope Paul VI, um, uh, with the signatures and the uh, support of many non-Catholics as well, who were concerned that the the Apostolic Roman Rite would be um, w would be diminished and and would be lost um, to the great detriment of Western culture, Western civilization as a whole, the Western inheritance, um, and all of the musical and artistic and figurative artifacts that have uh, beautified the the Roman rite through the centuries. Um, and there was something about the kind of ecumenical nature, perhaps, of this uh, petition that uh, meant that it got a hearing. And then famously, when Paul VI was scanning the, the names that had signed uh, this petition, he alighted on that of um, Agatha Christie, and he himself was uh, an enthusiast of the um, Her Hercule Poirot novels, who is uh, who was a, a fictional Belgian um, Catholic detective, and he he then saw ah, Agatha Christie, and um, and signed the the petition, much to the chagrin of his um, of of many of the uh, the kind of modernist. Um, liturgical innovators uh, in the Roman Curia at that time, that an exception would be made. So this this created the condition for um, the um, the support the 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 allowance of um, some uh, traditional um, masses to uh, take place um, within the canonically regular structures um, for older priests. Um, this dispensation. Uh, was secured. So that meant that the um, the English Catholic movement always had, um, let's say, more sort of institutional tolerance than uh, was the case in many other countries where um, tradition was uh, fiercely and ferociously uh, attacked and, and uh, often almost completely stamped out as a result, uh, other than the... Um, uh, the, the security provided by the SSPX uh, missions, 
Um, and this uh, movement uh, was centered on the Latin Mass Society, um, of which um, our, uh, my, my fellow contributing editor, Dr. Joseph Shaw, is the current uh, president, the, the current chairman. Um, and that is, to this day, the largest, um, most sort of well-organized, lay-led um, apostolate uh, for the defense of the apostolic Roman rite and has a, a leading role within the uh, Una Voce uh, Federation um, worldwide uh, for that reason. So um, that's one major uh, sort of proximate uh, factor for the prominence of uh, English Catholics in the traditional cause. And another one is the... Um, is the the is is from the history of um the catholic church in england and the fact that english catholics uh know what it is to be a, a persecuted minority um there has been no more um savage uh, uh or long-lasting persecution of catholics really in any country um at least any formerly catholic country um in in the modern era than um in the in england uh wales scotland and ireland the the countries of the united kingdom over the period of what was called the the penal laws um where the the um the protestant uh, heretical establishment um was explicitly um sort of defined against the uh the the one true uh, church and did its best to persecute Catholics into oblivion. And um, this state of affairs endured for um, almost 300 years. So for that reason, English Catholics, I think, have a, a sort of corporate memory of what it is to be despised and uh, alienated by the establishment and I think something of that instinct sort of uh, came out, particularly in the early years of the traditional movement, meaning that um, English Catholics have a, a sort of certain uh, resilience to uh, that kind of oppression, um, perhaps combined with a, a sort of dogged, um, quite stoical, stiff upper lip uh, within their own national temperament, uh, which meant that they weren't going to be uh, sort of bullied into submission. Uh, which seems to have happened in in many other countries as well. Um, so I, I think I think those are some factors there for the sort of vitality of the uh, traditional movement in the British Isles and England in particular. Yes, this is the um, really the basis for Michael Davies' famous trilogy on the liturgical revolution because he compares what happened in 1969 with the Novus Ordo Mise with what happened under the heretical Anglican regime because the Latin mass was, a, was abolished at that time, was banned at that time by the establishment. And the Latin mass was really only, was it 1829 with the emancipation when it was really, there, there was private chapels for various monarchs and whatnot. Right. But that was, that was when the Latin mass really came back to England and the British Isles, 1829. And then we have yeah. a little bit over a hundred years later we we have the latin mass banned again except this time inside the church that's yes. uh, certainly a, a remarkable history to recount um yeah davies really is the scholar to to as you say draw the the parallels uh between these sort of periods of of persecution and um conducted a lot of very valuable studies on the uh, resistance to um, the Protestant Revolution and um, uh, wrote a, a work called uh, They Died for the, the Holy Mass. I think there's a talk under that name as well about the, the Cornish Prayer Book Rebellion um, and also earlier the Pilgrimage of Grace, which were, um, you know, popular uprisings against the suppression of uh, the Holy Mass. So um, there are great uh, lessons and inspirations to be drawn from our, our fathers in the faith there. Now, 
can you comment at all on, on the role of the laity, the role of sort of the, the common folk uh, in this case? Because in the Anglican case, we have these elites who are trying to impose something from on high. In the same case of our day, we also have elites, as you said, in the Roman Curia, trying to impose something from on high on the common little folk. Um, what is the role in the English history and the Catholic uh, counter-revolutionary history of just the lay folk, the, the common people in this movement? Well, I think um, we've talked before about how it's it's something of, well, it's certainly an emergency situation that we're in. And so the, um, the sort of imperatives that are proper to the clergy and laity have become somewhat uh, murky and um, in, in a sense, laity have had to step into the breach uh, for um, to, to wage struggles and to sort of conduct um, uh, actions which which are not sort of normative to the lay state, shall we say. Um, but certainly the the people um, in those, uh, you know, counter revolutions that I mentioned, the Cornish Prayer Book Rebellion 1549 um, led the resistance the reaction to the revolutionary action uh which had deprived them deprived them of the holy sacrifice of the mass and they um they alarmed their local sadly their mostly apostate clergy uh with their fervor in um in one in in, in demanding the restoration of the uh the traditional mass now um, you know the the mass itself is is um, is an action that is the the set the you know the central action of the clerical state of the ordained, um, but the the laity as the um, the bride shall we say in that romance of the the liturgy, uh, nevertheless um, uh, you know uh, draw of course their their spiritual life the graces flow from uh from the holy sacrifice of the mass and when the clergy have um failed uh to uh do their duty and to um to de protect and defend um the liturgy that expresses the transcendent uh action of the holy sacrifice then as i say the laity have um often uh shown more um more fervor and zeal in defending it excellent yes uh certainly the case with the modern traditional movement um can you comment at all on the interplay between europe and the united states in the traditional movement um different cultures but still very european um any thoughts on that this is what i wrote in your announcement one of the things we're trying to internationalize and, and build bridges and, and unite the clans across the Atlantic. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, of course, the traditional movement is is truly Catholic in its reach and representation across the world. Um, I think we can certainly we certainly should be seeking to develop, uh, strengthen those ties um, I'm fortunate uh, to be another sort of um, fortuitous um, aspect of the English movement is that obviously we have access to all the traditional discourse um, within the Anglosphere, but at the same time, we're geographically co close to the continent. So um, next month, I hope to be attending the uh, pilgrimage of Our Lady of Christendom in Chartres, uh, to Chartres in France, with... Um, perhaps more than 14,000 um, faithful in attendance from all across the world. And that is an event that really um, embodies the international nature of the movement. Um, it's interesting. I think it's, it's, um, it's very difficult to argue with the, the claim that the center of the action the the conflict between the revolution and the counter revolution with regard in within the church is within the united states today i think there's something very providential going on there that uh, america which has been in the vanguard of 
modernity and, and many of its noxious effects is also the place where the most resistance to modernism within the church is um, is taking place. Um, now, I think that we perhaps get a slightly distorted picture uh, just with the English uh, press and everything, not seeing quite what's going on in, in France and and the, the Hispanic world, for example, and so on. But I think it's w without a doubt the, the most, the sort of active resistance is in the United States. And that's something that uh, Pope Francis and um, some of the the modernists within Rome have have noted sort of time and again. So um, uh, I think that um, America uh, has a great sort of responsibility in this moment, or American Catholics, I should say, um, and um, it's it's a, also a sort of providential moment to address some of the. Um, the uh, unhelpful, unhealthy tendencies within American Catholicism. I mean, every, you know, uh, uh, group of Catholics in every country has had different uh, tendencies to work against, uh, to have to correct, to have to remedy. And I think I'm, I'm encouraged to see Americans, American Catholics uh, sort of taking the time now to address those, uh, which is also, um, you know, providential uh, and coincidental with, um, as I say, this this salient position of American traditionalists um, in um, fighting for and spreading the liturgical and doctrinal integrity of the faith. Excellent. Well, you mentioned revolution and counter-revolution. And what we did in our editorial stance was to, we wanted to contextualize the modern traditional movement as we understand it in the 1960s to today within the context of the counter-revolutionary movement that was happening mostly in Europe. So in the United States during this time, that in the late 18th century, there was a American revolution. And then the 19th century Catholics were very much uh, immigrant status trying to fit in in the United States. It was only really until the Germans came in later to a large degree. And that's where the, the Matt family comes in with their wanderer in the United States. But the counter-revolution was really happening in Europe, and that was where the momentum was coming from. And we want to contextualize traditionalism within this whole momentum against revolution. So can you break down, I think some viewers might not be familiar with the terminology being used here, because I think uh, sometimes you know people say, well, we're fighting against the revolution. Uh, well, I think, first of all, what is the revolution? And then what is counter Catholic counter revolutionary activity. Yes, certainly. So that term, the revolution, often with a capital R, originates really with the writings of um, Catholic faithful Catholics in the 19th century. And they were sort of coming to terms with the great trauma, the great catastrophe of the French Revolution, sometimes called as the Great French Revolution, which really um, was was marked, um, as Joseph de May said, for its satanic character and for um, for the the fact of its great rupture with what remained of Christendom, with the Christian social order. Um, it it uh, sort of culminated. Um, a number of trends which had uh, been uh, sort of metastatizing in uh, France, but also in other Catholic countries in Europe uh, between uh, what between the Reformation and Revolution, between the Protestant Revolution and the French Revolution. Um, these currents had been uh, sort of growing in strength, and so um, as as Catholics um, sort of. Uh, dusted themselves off and, and got back on their feet after the great um, anti-Catholic persecution of the French revolutionary terror and um, the the Napoleonic regime that followed um, and with the victory of the the allied powers against Napoleon finally in 1815 in the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy. Um, you had uh, a sort of uh, a, a, a moment of reflection um, when Catholics were really starting to inquire as to how this great uh, event that had, had led to so much evil, such a cascade of, of error 
uh, and apostasy and de-Christianization, um, how this had taken place, this movement to uh, eliminate divine revelation as the ultimate principle of public policy and public law. Um, and what happened is that slowly these um, French intellectuals in particular would talk about the revolution and that term the revolution sort of grew and grew to encompass um, re any revolutionary action um, as a whole that sought to um, eliminate uh, divine revelation as the uh, the foundation of the social order, which which is sort of a definition of um, you know the Christian state um, and uh, the um, the body of Christian states was Christendom. And during the nineteenth century, the revolutions, the the fire in the in the minds of men, uh, as James Billington put it, spread throughout. Uh, the rest of Europe beyond France. So there were revolutions in Italy, in in Germany, in Spain, in Austria, um, in all these uh, formerly Catholic countries. Um, and so Catholic authors recognised the commonality uh, between these these different events. And um, this term that they were talking about, the revolution, the French Revolution, grew to was conflated with uh, revolution as a whole. Um, and the the theological aspects of the dimension of uh, those uh, uh, those events uh, was um, studied and analysed much more deeply, uh, and it came to be understood in its metaphysical uh, sense as uh, embodying disorder, uh, embodying the the overthrow of hierarchy as ordained by God, um, which is for the um, uh, for the political community to be subordinate to um, revealed religion, um, and for uh, communities of men to worship God in the manner that He has ordained for Christian for political communities to be inserted into the order of divine worship, and the revolutionaries were seeking to remove uh, uh, political communities from that order, and so translate communities back into um, the city of man, uh, the principality of Satan. Um, and the counter-revolution is the restoration of order, the reaction uh, against that, it's not an abstract movement uh, or, or, or a kind of um, a sort of pure return to the past, but um, the peace of Christ through the reign of Christ, Christian civilization, uh, which is hierarchical, which is ordered, uh, and it's fundamentally sacral. Um, and so that's that's how the term was used. And then the, the popes uh, of the 19th century also took up the term as well. So that there is a long um, intellectual tradition of referring to all of these efforts uh, from um, different sects and different um, heretics and, and revolutionaries uh, to destroy Christian civilization as the revolution. And then the the great uh, disaster of um, the 20th century in many ways was the the flame of the revolution revolution entering the church itself uh, with Vatican II or at least with the spirit of Vatican II, um, and suddenly the 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 great the, um, the 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 main sort of battlefront uh, went from being in the world to being within the church herself. Yes, this is a, a fantastic uh, summary. Thank you, Theo. Um, and what's, what's difficult with the United States and Europe is that just as the Holy Alliance is being built against the Napoleonic Revolution and this counter-revolutionary movement is beginning in Europe, the, the establishment in the United States, the government, which is mainly Protestant or radical, is establishing the Monroe Doctrine, which is actually a counter to the counter-revolution. And so then they're supporting the Masonic Revolution in Catholic Mexico, for example, or other such Mexican or Hispanic Masonic revolutions in the Americas. And so there's this revolutionary fervor in the Western Hemisphere that's happening at the same time, and Catholics get stuck in the middle of this. Um, I'd like to 
l- let me read this this quote from um, Notre Charge Apostolique from um, Pius X. I think that this really summarizes to a great degree this uh, counter-revolutionary movement, uh, which was put into our editorial board statement. He says this, this is in the condemnation of uh, Le Sion, um, which was a French movement which sought to somewhat compromise with some aspects of the revolution. Pius X says this, we must repeat with the utmost energy in these times of social and intellectual anarchy when everyone takes it upon himself to teach as a teacher and lawmaker. The city cannot be built otherwise than as God has built it. Society cannot be set up unless the church lays the foundations and supervises the work. No, civilization is not something yet to be found, nor is the new city to be built on hazy notions. It has been in existence and still is. It is Christian civilization. It is the Catholic city. It has only to be set up and restored continually against the unremitting attacks of insane dreamers and rebels and miscreants. Omnia in Saurare, in Christo, restore all things in Christ. Uh, Theo, any comments on that quotation from Pius X? Yes, well, of course, that's um, um, a wonderful uh, sort of synopsis of um, the mission of counter-revolution um, that that I think, um, you know, is, is in essence uh, still true today, although perhaps um, the, you know, the historical um, context of the time uh, might, might prompt a different sort of tactical uh, reflections. So this is in response to the 1905 uh, French secularization, which um, was the uh, sort of culmination of the long 19th century French struggle um, between Catholics and atheistic Republicans. Or as Louis Villot summarized very well, this struggle between revelation and revolution, that's really what it comes down to, what's going to be the the uh, basis of the social order. Um, so to um, uh, to just comment on uh, St. Pius X's um, letter here to the French Catholics, um, he's quite right, the Catholic city, he's talking about the city of God. So the, the counter-revolutionary is Augustinian and the liberal Catholic um, Weltanschauung uh, is... Uh, de-Augustinianized. Uh, Dr. Thomas Pink talks about um, Vatican II and the post-Vatican II moment being the de-Augustinianization of the church. Um, Augustine, who sets up a dramatic uh, conflict and contrast between the city of God, uh, the kingdom of heaven on earth, the church, the holy church, um, the community of the baptized, the communion of the baptized, uh, and the the city of man and the two uh, passions, uh, the two loves that build those cities. And here St. Pius X is exhorting French Catholics to re- redouble their efforts to restore the Catholic city, um, which has become vitiated, has become weakened by this time. Uh, and, and he points out that Christian civilization is not an abstraction, it's not something yet to be found, as he says here. We, we have the, the plan and um, Christianity, the witness of Christianity must include an apologetic for Christendom, an apologia for Christendom, because, um, ob- because man is a, a social animal. And so if you do not uh, tell him what his society would look like if it wasn't, if it was transformed by the gospel, not just uh, individual souls, but if, if uh, his society was transformed, if you don't uh testify to that when you are evangelizing him then you're not evangelizing the whole man and therefore there's a kind of unreality in your transmission of the gospel uh unless you um you you correctly uh present christianity as a public religion a public cult um and so this has been uh instantiated before with the history of christendom christian civilization which is just the lay side the temporal side of the catholic church of the city of god um but if you do not make an an apologia for that that um settlement that political settlement that uh perdured called christendom then 
it you, you it, I would say that you it um it fatally undermines an, an effort to transmit the gospel today because um you you you're sort of dealing with an abstraction as St Pius X is pointing out here um and if it's been tried and found wanting I'm not saying it was perfect but if if it's been tried and and found to um to be somehow um uh deficient in in essence then that uh sort of holds divine revelation below the waterline and sort of renders christianity itself absurd uh so it is absolutely um it is absolutely necessary for us today as counter revolutionaries to defend the historical reality of christendom and seek to restore it as uh, saint Pius x exhorts the lay french catholics there Yes, that's wonderful. The revelation versus revolution. Uh, it really, I think that, that that's great what you just said, because it, it does really go to the heart of the credibility of our own faith. If our own faith cannot build society. Uh, I'd like to continue with the conversation on what is Catholic, what is a Catholic counter-revolutionary with just bringing up our editorial stance and just go through these three paragraphs where we kind of talk talk in passing about this movement of counter-revolutionary activity um, to just contextualize our modern traditionalism. Um, and so we say we say this, and Theo, I'd just like to get your comments on, on these three paragraphs. Um, 1 Peter 5 represents the anti-modernist effort that began before Vatican II. Its fundamental basis was the spiritual sword wielded by popes against modern errors going back to Pius VI in 1794. That was the condemnation of the Synod of Pistoia, Actorum Fidei, uh, which later goes to the strength and orthodoxy of St. Pius X. It was the subtle mind of Newman and the precision of Franzelin. Um, what are your thoughts on the spiritual sword aspect of the counter revolution? Yes, so the the church is the the whole of the faithful, the baptized, not just the clergy, um, and yet, uh, well, so so in in a sense, um, as Christopher Ferrara, Ferrara pointed out, uh, Christendom was a liturgical polity. Christendom is the civilization which surrounds and and beautifies and and is rooted in the holy mass and um this perhaps is something that's that's worth sort of um accentuating i mentioned about how um saint augustine um his vision for the city of man is the is the insertion of um political communities of men into the order of divine worship um christendom christian political order is based on right worship um and so there is uh you know a fitting uh continuity here when the uh the throne and the the half the altar were attacked um that the the struggle to to restore to defend um these um these vital elements of uh the christian social order would would all be together um and uh you you have it uh, right there with cardinal newman um and uh, cardinal newman recognized that to be deep in history was to cease to be protestant what he meant was that the the um the flow of tradition uh has not been uh sort of turned off uh or interrupted in uh christian history if only we would seek it out. Uh, he wrote, the past has returned, the dead lives, the, Catholic, the English church was and the English church was not, and the English church is once again, this is a portent worthy of a cry, is the coming of a second spring. That was uh, his writing um, on the Catholic emancipation uh, in 1829, so it's also part of this, uh, this moment, this, this uh, response of the church to the, um, the sort of crystallization of the errors um of the revolutionaries in the french revolution excellent so um it continues with the the kind of revolutionary and lay leaders rose up we have the vendee in particular uh, with the french revolution we have o'connell in ireland de maistre 
VO, and others with the Carlists. We also have the Ninth Crusaders, the Papal Zouaves. And then later, we also have the Matt family and the German immigrants in the United States. Um, any comments on any of these uh, figures that arose during this time? Yes, well, there, there's, um, you know, a very sort of um, esteemed, illustrious group of counter-revolutionaries who Catholics today should be reading about and, um, you know, uh, drawing inspiration from, understanding their thought more deeply, their sort of penetrating uh, understanding of modernity and of um, a Catholic's uh, sort of life of grace um, within the the sort of uh, the, the contemporary zeitgeist. Um, and I, I, I think that um, one uh, part of 1 Peter 5's mission that is, is so um, commendable here is um, our desire to um, connect and expose uh, Anglophone readers to the counter-revolutionary traditionalist thought uh, from lots of uh, non-Anglophone countries, you know, that the, the great uh, counter-revolutionary struggle was really centred in uh, places like France and um, Spain and Austria, where Catholic society was not an abstraction. It was just, it was just lived. <laughs> it, the, the doctrine wasn't yes. uh, recorded because it was just how people live their lives. Um, and so we should uh, certainly sort of lean heavily on uh, on on their uh, writings and and on their insights. Um, I, I mean Carlism is is perhaps worth noting in particular as a as the oldest political movement uh, in the world uh, today um, for the defense of the Catholic city. Um, and there, there's a sort of deeper meaning uh, in the, um, the 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 Carlist struggle beyond um, the actual dynastic question of um, uh, the the Spanish monarchy, uh, the legitimate Spanish line, but its embodiment as the historical continuity of old Spain, um, as uh, the sort of the vessel of um, uh, Thomistic thought in the political arena, um, and the importance of old Spain, Hispanidad, as continuing the uh, the sort of the Lumen Christi of Christendom after the uh, the great uh, Protestant uh, heresy, um, and that's bound up with with the continuity of one family, the royal family, but that symbolizes the continuity and vitalization of all the families, um, of all the families of the realm, um, and that's that's why you see with um, almost all these counter revolutionaries are linked to to the uh to the uh, legitimist struggle the the monarchist um defense of of throne um which is a defense of fatherhood as well um and that uh struggle uh obviously has become incredibly heightened in our own time as well uh that you can see is where uh, the revolutionaries have focused so much of their efforts uh in destroying attempting to destroy Yes. Uh, we'll click on the links in these uh, in this editorial stance. It goes to more information about each of these. Um, I want to recommend this text in particular uh, from John Rao. This is called Removing the Bl Blindfold, 19th Century Catholics and the Myth of Modern Freedom by John Rao, uh, one of the great traditional Catholic intellectuals of our day. And he goes into this revolution counter-revolutionary struggle in europe in particular goes he he highlights in particular the um the jesuit civilta catholica the italian journal uh but also the the french counter-revolutionaries and beyond so um definitely a great text to take a look at to learn more about that um and then finally we have this final comment here is that the soul of the movement has always been liturgical. And you've already highlighted that a great deal, Theo. Um, exemplified in the piety of Guéranger, uh, and, and its heart has been aesthetic. The beauty of composers, painters, sculptors, and architects like Pugin, working within the great tradition, and later the works of Tolkien. So 
we have this revolution and what's interesting uh, we haven't commented on this yet but it is interesting how much it really is an aesthetic revolution and how it, it really does make war on beauty itself and it's, we see that especially in the 20th century i think uh with four more utilitarian bases of aesthetic thought so that everything is utilitarian. We've got concrete churches. We've got all of this ugliness everywhere. So Theo, can you comment on the aesthetic aspect? And I can bring up some Pugin if you'd like to comment as well. Yes. Well, I've touched on um, the relationship here between the political counter-revolutionary struggle and um, the liturgical counter-revolutionary struggle, how Christendom was uh flowed from the holy sacrifice of the mass and the effort to um to re-establish uh the true religion as the basis of the social order and to sacralize uh society is an effort to reflect the truth goodness and beauty of the holy mass to have a a, a culture a civilization that reflects the truth goodness and beauty of the uh holy mass uh, in its entirety and that was what those uh, secular uh, and non-Catholic um, signat uh, si uh, signatories of the Agatha Christie indult recognized when they defended the aesthetic importance of the apostolic Roman rite. Um, so um, yes, uh, beauty itself is is order. We have the, the, the three sort of the characteristics of beauty that St. Thomas Aquinas um, describes, uh, clarity, uh integrity and can you remember the third one symmetry uh, symmetry that's yeah. right yes exactly um so so it's it's objective uh it's not in the eye of the beholder uh of course as you say with with modernism um the attempt to dissolve the category of supernature into nature um that kind of transcendent meditation that is necessary for the artist to render be beauty in the material sphere uh is is lost kind of necessarily um and uh you mentioned the great english catholic architect augustine pugin augustus pugin um who well his his father was was french um but he came to england in the aftermath of the french revolution part of this providential um uh, fruit of uh, that great trauma, um, and he had a, a philosophy to his his architecture, his recovery of the the Gothic style. One as one of the leading figures of the Gothic revival, it was part of this Ninth Crusade, this spirit of the nineteenth century, which was uh, responding to in a vigorous way the errors of uh, the previous century's so called Enlightenment, uh, naturalism, rationalism, empiricism atheism um all the the currents uh within that movement um and uh the 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 style that, that prevailed um immediately before pugin's um life uh before his before he was born and in his early years was neoclassicism which is a return to uh the greco-roman um uh greco-roman style um uh, the vernacular, uh, which um, obviously is the, the the cornerstone of Western architecture, but um, was characterized by a sort of um, uh, a disdain for the um, the period styles of Christian architecture, such as the Baroque and the Gothic, which had come before the 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 sort of maxim for neoclassicism was noble simplicity and calm grandeur but it was also um very cold very um very pagan uh, in inspiration and uh, a, a, you know an, a material expression of this uh this revolutionary attempt to uh, deprive western man of divine revelation so pugin's um approach was uh, opposite to that and he he uh, as you can see was a great lover of gothic architecture which he just called pointed or christian architecture um so so he was um you know very forthright in his defense of uh medieval gothic uh, the medieval gothic creed 
um, and uh, it transformed the face, the architectural face of England, uh, his his in immense uh, legacy, his immense immense work in a, a short, so tragically short life uh, li um, uh, lifetime. Uh, but he had a great influence, um, not just uh, among Catholics, um, but he had this this passion for the purity of the medieval vision, uh, which sometimes was a little bit exaggerated. Uh, for example, he said that the cupola of St. Peter's in Rome uh, was, quote, a humbug, a failure, an abortion, a massive imposition and a sham constructed even more vilely than it was designed. Um, so I don't think we'd necessarily uh, uh, agree with his view there. Um, but he it, it expressed the fact that he had this kind of, you know, singular focus on the Gothic. Um, and and uh, he certainly... Um, uh, was uh, critical to uh, the flowering of the Gothic uh, that you can see here. This is in the uh, the Houses of Parliament, uh, in particular the the Chamber of the House of Lords. So this is the the first chamber in precedent in the um, British Houses of Parliament, and you can see the the throne of the the sovereign, um, uh, which is you know the the centre of of sovereignty uh, in the United Kingdom. That's why I included it in my article uh, on so-called European, on integralism within Europe. And you'll notice above um, in that triptych of paintings, you have three paintings uh, to represent um, charity, uh, sorry, faith in the middle, uh, chivalry and justice. I think um, so. The first in the middle is is King Saint Ethelbert of Kent being baptized by Saint Augustine of Canterbury, um, which was uh, which Saint Bede recounts in his ecclesiastical histories. He, saint Ethelbert was the first Anglo-Saxon king to um, to be baptized and to uh, establish divine revelation as the principle of public policy and public law, uh, and therefore um, the first sort of Christian king. Um, at least following the um, the breakdown of the the Roman Empire um, and in the West, and um, that painting that that obviously the baptism of the king symbolizes the baptism of the nation as a whole. So that that uh, central panel there um, it, it was included by Pugin to express the fact that this is where um, England comes from. The moment that it, that England herself accepted um our lord jesus christ as her lord and savior and and was baptized as as a as a a, a corporate whole um and then um i'm not too the, i can't I, I can't quite remember the details of the other two paintings but i think the painting to do with chivalry is um king edward the third uh, establishing the order of the garter which is um the most senior order of chivalry in the united kingdom and one of the first sort of secular order of chivalries uh, secular orders of chivalry, uh, which obviously took their inspiration from the great effort, the great lay effort of the uh, the Crusades in the High Middle Ages, um, and indeed the flag of England is the cross of Saint George, the patron saint of chivalry, uh, which is also the banner of the resurrection, um, which we have seen uh, obviously in this uh, period of the liturgical year quite a lot in various pieces of artwork. So you can see how all of these. Um, all the iconography of um, Christian history uh, sort of inter uh, interacts uh, and is compenetrant. Um, and this is what Pugin was drawing from. Um, so he built the Westminster uh, House of Parliament here. Also Big Ben, uh, the most famous clock tower in the world, probably recently restored. Very beautiful. Uh, lots of American tourists like visiting it. Um, so it's an expression of, of Catholic beauty. Um, of a sacralized order, and I touched on this in my article on integralism, what, how sacrality is different to sanctity. Sanctity is proper to the spiritual uh, the spiritual sphere, a spiritual order. Uh, sanctity is something that touches on divine worship. Um, and uh, so we talk about, you know, sacred vessels which contain uh, the sacred species, uh, the, the uh, blessed sacrament itself, uh, or the sacred vestments, the, the vestments that the priest uh, wears in order to offer sacrifice, to participate in the sacrifice on Calvary. Uh, the church, obviously, is a, a sacred architecture, uh, architecture which will 
uh, house and uh, can you know um, uh, sort of uh, surround the the holy sacrifice of the mass. Um, so that's within the sacred order, but sacrality is is sort of the the lay participation, which is um, to uh, transform or transfigure the 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 temporal order in order to direct men to uh, to divine worship. And this is exactly what St. Augustine means when he says when he's talking about inserting political or, uh, communities into the order of divine worship. Here's an example of a sacralized landscape. The the uh, cityscape of um, Salzburg, Brock, uh, beautiful city in uh, in Austria, one of Europe's most beautiful, and you can see it's dominated by the spires, which which literally point man to heaven. If if your civil if your city is dominated by the spires of of banks uh, and uh, you know advertising billboards, uh, then you've got your priorities as a civilization very wrong. Uh, you've got false idols established in your civilization. Um, and obviously a ca Catholic civilization was established by right order, which is pointing man to his final end, uh, first and foremost. Uh, so that is a sacralized city landscape. And that's the effort of the laity. And that's what Pugin was looking to do as well. The Houses of Parliament are not um, uh, sacred architecture. It's not, a, it's not a church, but it borrows uh, elements from ecclesial architecture, the Gothic style, the pointed uh, the Gothic arch, um, the you know uh, ribbed vaulting, and um, the, all the different elements of Gothic architecture, in order to um, sacralize the um, the temporal uh, space and remind the the legislators of the United Kingdom that uh, their legislation should be subordinate to the salvation of souls. That the you know supreme law is the salvation of souls, and that is expressed in that painting being above the throne of the sovereign, uh, which is the baptism of England, that England is is a fundamentally Catholic and Christian. Uh, and he was able to do that in a, in, in, under an Anglican uh, regime. Um, uh, such was the, the sort of sympathy for uh, the Ninth Crusade, this, this counter-revolutionary moment in the uh, early 19th century. Yeah, so this is the spirit of our forefathers in the modern period that we want to reclaim, recapture, and spread and promote at 1 Peter 5. Um, Theo, final thoughts on uh, maybe of a more practical character or a tactical nature. Uh, you mentioned earlier how the counter-revolutionaries in uh, parts of France or Bavaria or Austria uh, were simply living the faith, and they had always lived the faith. There hadn't been a break. Uh, what are any practical things that uh, people can do to participate in counter-revolution in our day today? Yes, yeah, so this is um, a, you know a vital um, vital question within um, the life of the laity in particular. Uh, that I'd like to elaborate uh, in future articles. Um, but suffice to say now that um, man is a political animal. And so um, we, uh, you know, order our actions towards the conversion of the polity uh, and the translation of uh, our political communities from the city of man to the city of God. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of water has gone under the bridge since uh, those counter-revolutionaries of the 19th century where the memory of Christendom was still quite fresh. Uh, unfortunately, um, we've lost more battles than we've won since then. Um, and uh, the situation has got darker and darker. Um, and our own time is characterized by basically the loss of public institutions now. Um, I don't know if irrevocably, but certainly... It seems irrecuperable at the moment. Um, you know, the courts, the universities, uh, the governments, um, the, uh, you know, medical uh, institutions, businesses, major businesses in particular. These are all these are now all aggressively revolutionary uh, and uh, Marxist uh, in many cases. Um, so um, but that doesn't change uh, what we as laity are commanded to do. Um, so I think that I would echo my friend um, Don Miguel Ayuso and say that since the political sphere is um, 
is is lost to us in a practical sense that doesn't mean that we cease to be political but we work in the pre-political sphere which is the cultural and that's why i'm glad that you mentioned what can laity do in their own lives living their faith that's exactly where they should be focusing their efforts in sacralizing um their own lives uh their own families their own communities focusing on the local um that's where culture will arise from uh, john senior said that the or paul the sixth actually i think uh said that the great disaster of our times was the separation of uh the culture from the gospel um and you know if christ is not in the the experience and imagination of man then it's it's difficult for him to be in in the hearts and minds of men uh and our culture has become so revolutionary and so de-christianized um that we need to i think be humble and um um perhaps uh deprioritize taking back institutions i'm not saying that that's not something we should be seeking to do but i'm talking about a question of priority uh it should be um recognizing how fragmented disintegrated things are today and and that we need to um uh reconstitute um uh institutions at a, a local level um and grow from there so there's been a lot of discussion about the benedict option and i want to um meditate on this within my article but i, I think that drea's uh presentation of it was was false uh because it, he fundamentally affirms the american political order it's a it's a liberal and ecumenical um project that he presents uh, as um as uh, Michael Voris said, uh, it would be sort of bringing the disease into the bunker uh, to to uh, uh, sort of you know in, encompass Protestantism within uh, a, an attempt to um, create uh, parallel societies. Um, however, I think in essence his idea of um, and this is not you know lots of Catholics have been talking about this a kind of tactical withdrawal from institutions in order to build parallel institutions. Um, does have uh significant merit so that's uh something i'd like to kind of think of more but certainly you know we we need to discern what god's calling us to in our own lives which is to you know sanctify our souls uh to to spread the kingdom of heaven in our souls and then in our families and in our communities and then in the world um and so um of course that's why the struggle is now so fiercely being waged with to defend the holy sacrifice of the mass which is from where we draw our graces um so um that is uh you know very much a, a fitting priority but i don't think we should lose sight of um the the uh the more um normative uh lay activity in the counter revolution at the same time yes thank you so much theo that that certainly gets to the heart of many of our priorities at 1 peter 5 uh the series by matthew pleasy of restoring customs Right. seems to be uh one of my favorites that that he's done uh just restoring these different customs within your family so that your children are raised with this just normative view of this is how we live our lives and this is just normal life and this culture is so much more powerful than political power political mm -hmm. power trying to impose on on a people this or that thing is weak in comparison to organic society that's just grown from the family that's what our lord did he 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 began the church in families he didn't seize the political power from on high he he captured it from below and so thank you for um breaking some of that down theo so um everyone please um like and subscribe to the uh, one peter five youtube channel you can check out theo howard's uh, articles at onepeter5.com. Uh, he is linked there. Uh, we also ask you to support our spring fundraiser. Uh, we depend on your donations to keep the content at One Peter 5 free for all. So please support our spring fundraiser, onepeter5.com slash donate. And we uh, let's end with an Ave Maria to offer all of this to Our Lady. This is the icon of Our Lady of Fatima in Church Slavonic that we've been trying to promote. So let's pray an Ave Maria to commend this to Our Lady. Nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Amen. 
Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Christ is risen. <laughs>